Good morning, everyone. Before I get to the topic of the day, I want to provide an update on our work on the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA, program. Last week, the Department of Labor and the Agency of Digital Services stood up this brand new system to provide unemployment assistance to the self-employed, independent contractors, and others who aren't traditionally covered under unemployment insurance. As of this morning, 9,500 claimants are in the system. Of those, 8,500 are eligible and have submitted a total of 39,000 weekly claims so far. Uh, I admit that that's complicated in some respects, but it's based on the fact that they're able to file for back weeks in their claims. So uh, one person may be able to file for four or five uh, claims, depending on how many weeks it's been. The first round of direct deposit payments totaling $24 million are going out today. Uh, as most of us know, this is much needed money getting in the hands of Vermonters. For those who opted to receive their uh, check by paper, uh, those payments will be scheduled uh, for next week to be cut. So you should receive those uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. I know far too many uh, have waited weeks uh, to receive benefits, and I hope that this provides some relief for them. But I also know we still have a lot more work to do to get benefits into the hands of all eligible Vermonters. And we won't stop until that's done. So with that, uh, we'll go on to today's topic. As you know, my team and I have been working on strategies to help restart Vermont's economy and get pe more people back to work. But at the same time, it's important we do the following. Protect those at the greatest risk from COVID-19. Continue to slow the spread of this virus and quickly respond to outbreaks as they happen. To do this, we've set five principles to guide our work. And today, we're here to talk about plans under principle number three, which is to increase testing and tracing. This goal is incredibly important to restart our economy because as we ease those restrictions, more testing and tracing will help us quickly identify and isolate outbreaks. If you think of this whole pandemic as a forest fire, testing will allow us to spot those embers early and contact tracing allows us to surround it in order to contain it. Through hard work and creativity, We've done a pretty good job here in Vermont uh, testing uh, on our testing capacity, even as other states have struggled. And we also have strong contact tracing uh, as well. But we must build on this model by increasing everything we're doing and adding new technology as well. Doing so will help make sure that if we slowly ease restrictions, we're able to identify cases and prevent the spread of this virus. Our goal is to ramp up so we can conduct up to 1,000 tests per day, about 7,000 per week, which is more than double what we've been doing over the last several weeks. With this goal in mind, I've established a testing and tracing uh, task force, which will help roll out this program with support by new technology and then deploy it across the state. I'm pleased to say steps to increase testing have already begun and a plan is in place to phase its growth over the next several weeks. Simultaneously ramping up our testing while tracing and connecting with the contacts of those testing positive will allow us to continue opening the economic spigot and make sure we don't lose ground on the progress we've made thus far. The enhanced testing and tracing will also give us more information on where we may need to focus more of our resources and will help us better understand infection rates. From day one, the team has uh, taken a, da a data-driven scientific approach to our decision-making and will continue to do so in order to do all we can to make sure the health and safety of all Vermonters are protected. Uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso will share more about our strategy in a minute but it will be a measured approach. And just like our restart, uh, restart strategy, it will not be a flip of the switch. My team has developed a phased approach in order to maintain the supply chain we need 
uh, which is so important. That means we'll continue to stockpile materials so we're prepared for any future outbreaks. I know there are some who may want us to turn on this increased testing overnight, but by taking this approach, we can give our public health workers the room they need to make adjustments along the way so we don't ramp up too fast too soon. It's also important to remember that no matter what amount of testing we do, uh, it won't completely eliminate the risk. In fact, an increase in testing and tracing will only help in our restore, restart efforts if we also continue to separate ourselves, wash our hands, disinfect things that we touch and wear a mask. It's literally still in our hands. And individually, we can help control this. In many respects, it's really up to each and every one of us to make this work. I know this has been incredibly challenging for all of us, but thanks to the hard work and sacrifices of Vermonters, we're seeing a decrease in the spread of the virus. As I've said before, we cannot declare victory yet. The work must continue uh, to help keep our families, friends, and neighbors safe. But if we continue to rise to this challenge, I'm hopeful we can open up the economy in the near future, get Vermonters back to work, and begin enjoying all the state has to offer by slowly lifting these restrictions. We have done and will continue to do this together, and I could not be more thankful and more proud to be a Vermonter. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for an update to talk about uh, the testing in particular. Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Some weeks ago now, we set a goal to increase testing. And I want to be clear, we're talking about testing now of the nasal and oral secretions that indicate an active infection of COVID-19. We're not talking about antibody testing or serology testing that we've covered in previous press conferences recently. The work of the task force now will be to oversee our next big push to expand testing even further. Over the next few weeks, we'll work to ramp up our testing capabilities to, as you just heard, 1,000 tests a day, 7,000 a week. That's about triple the average number of tests that we've been conducting over the last several weeks. Ever since the start of this pandemic, as a state, we've worked aggressively to ensure the testing supplies needed to maintain stable and consistent access for testing sites across the state. It's important to remember that having ample testing supplies hasn't always been the case. In the early days of the pandemic, we were literally 48 hours uh, range of running out of test supplies altogether. But since that time, we've worked very diligently and continuously to grow our stock of in-state supplies, to forge relationships with private labs to help speed processing of tests. Now, not a day goes by that we do not report out all of our laboratory capabilities and capacities. We've been laser focused on this. As a result, we've been able to offer testing to more and more Vermonters over time. Governor Scott has instructed that we continue the work to stock these materials, not only so we can take on greatly expanded testing, but also to make sure we are adequately prepared in the event of a second wave of illness, which is a very smart move. The Vermont Department of Health Laboratory has literally been working nonstop for two months, and I want to publicly recognize and thank this experienced and committed team for their Herculean efforts. And I also wish to thank the University of Vermont Medical Center for their work in triaging of laboratory tests and in acquiring the resources needed to produce collection and testing kits. And we'll continue to work alongside UVM Medical Center to help bolster that production. This has been a fantastic partnership and a true team effort, and we're grateful for their continued strong support of our testing program. Our ability to keep acquiring these additional supplies while working with community partners to produce in-state tests will be key to our success in expanding testing and contact tracing. As a state, we've shown our collective strength, innovative spirit, 
resourcefulness and creativity throughout this pandemic, and this must continue as we move forward. The task force will evaluate the testing capabilities of our state and out-of-state labs to determine the optimal use of the multiple labs currently serving Vermont. We believe it may be possible to identify ways to increase testing capacity while freeing up resources and personnel to take on the other work critical to our ongoing efforts to limit the spread of illness and restart Vermont. Will everyone be able to get tested for COVID? Our team has identified several key groups that we will make testing available to in the coming weeks. It's imperative that as we ramp up our testing and contact tracing capacity, we carefully identify and address any gaps in this plan. The task force, in consultation with other departments, agencies, and community partners, will manage any concerns and needs that arise. And with this, we must be thoughtful in how we deploy our resources and our public health workers. Throughout this pandemic, we've worked hard to expand our testing guidelines beyond the federal recommendations, as long as we were operating in line with science and the data. We simply cannot roll out expanded testing without being very intentional in our planning to take into account which populations would benefit most. Throughout the planning process, we've sought to focus on vulnerable groups, to be strategic, evidence-based, and science-driven, to try to improve on lengthy quarantines for asymptomatic people, to strive to suppress outbreaks wherever they might arise, and of course, to be supportive of Restart Vermont efforts. So we will first focus on the residents of long-term care and other group living settings. That's important because here in Vermont, a very large percentage of the people who have tested positive for the virus and who are at highest risk for severe consequences have been in these settings. They clearly fit the definition of being highly vulnerable. These are the people who are most at risk of needing hospitalization, stretching our health care resources when we're trying to restart Vermont. It's critical for the health and safety of these populations that we act to limit spread of illness in these settings as quickly as possible. As a reminder, we currently provide testing for even the most mildly symptomatic patients, and recently to the entire population of pediatric patients, as well as testing of all residents and all staff in group living settings where there has been a single positive test. These include nursing homes, assisted living facilities, prisons, and certain high-density residential buildings that house vulnerable populations. Now, starting immediately, we'll expand testing at these facilities. For sites with COVID-positive patients, we will add day three, seven day, and 10 day and 14 day retesting of all residents and staff to prevent community-wide outbreaks. And for all sites, COVID positive or not, we will provide testing at intake, discharge, and for certain residents who require regular care outside of the facility. Further, we will offer testing to healthcare personnel who may have been exposed to COVID positive patients, but are themselves without symptoms. We will also offer testing to healthcare personnel who may be needed to aid the healthcare system's restart efforts. Expanding testing to this essential workforce will not only ensure that we keep our healthcare heroes safe, healthy, and ready to respond as they're needed, it will also be a critical tool in protecting Vermonters who count on these healthcare workers for their care. And finally, we now provide immediate testing at any correctional facility where there has been a positive test. If an inmate or a staff is symptomatic or identified as someone who may have been in contact with a COVID positive individual, they will immediately be tested. If that inmate or staff tests positive, everyone in the facility will immediately be tested. As part of our enhanced testing in this first phase of expanded testing, we will test all correction staff over the next two weeks. During the next phase, we will focus further testing on healthcare and home health workers who have had direct interaction with a COVID positive individual. 
While these workers certainly take every precaution to protect themselves while caring for Vermonters, we must further support them and give them and their families peace of mind with readily available testing. And when the time is right, we will coordinate with healthcare and other providers to put in place testing to help us reopen these services to Vermont. As our testing continues to expand, we'll use the strategy to ease some of the restrictions Vermonters have had to endure over the last few months. We'll consider testing for those who are in 14-day quarantine because they may have been exposed to the virus. We will increase opportunities for childcare workers to be tested. This is also critical as we begin to ask child care centers to reopen to provide the essential service that so many rely on. Increasing our testing to child care workers on top of the other expanded testing opportunities I've just outlined means we are taking another significant step in protecting Vermonters all across the state. As the governor noted, these expansions will not happen all at once, but will be phased in over the next few weeks with health alert notifications forthcoming. Dr. Kelso comes next. We've talked a lot about contact tracing in these uh, press conferences in the last uh, week or two. Uh, and Dr. Kelso is available to talk with us now about our expansion in that arena. Dr. Thank you. This increased testing capacity is only useful if we have an equally robust tracing system in place. The health department has a contact tracing program currently in place that connects with COVID-19 positive individuals, provides them information on isolation and available resources if they need them, and gathers information on individuals they've come in contact with and then reaches out to those contacts to inform them of possible exposure to the virus. While we've been successful in tracing our current positive cases, we have and will continue to add resources and personnel needed to address any uptick in positive cases that we project may arise with more testing and we'll use technology to help us. And we're doing expanded tracing to investigate the sources of positives by talking with cases not only about their recent contacts while they were contagious, but also before that period to help identify where they might have been exposed to COVID. We'll also make sure we continue to have adequate numbers of trained staff to perform tracing as we perform more testing. So we're prepared to trace up to 500 cases per week or even more if needed. For context, Currently, the tracing staff has been handling roughly 34 cases per week, and we have enough trained health department staff to handle up to 500 a week. We know that with increased testing, we're likely to see a rise in positive cases. And as we restart Vermont and more people are at work, each case may have more close contacts than our cases in the past several weeks have had. We'll be prepared to handle anywhere from 300 positive cases for the 7,000 tests per week, which is a higher positive rate than we've been experiencing during stay home, stay safe, to an even higher scenario of 900 positive cases per week. And we'll use technology to help in these efforts using an app called Sarah Alert, a secure monitoring and reporting system for public health created by the MITRE Corporation, where our own former health department commissioner, Dr. Paul Jarris, is the chief medical officer. This system, which other states are also using, allows us to offer to enroll cases and their trace contacts into the system to keep in touch and help with system management. If they're a case, they'll get a daily text, email, or phone call, whichever they choose, to check in on their symptoms and recovery. And if they're a contact of a case, they'll get a daily message to see whether they develop symptoms. This is not a location or proximity tracker. It's simply a system to help us monitor and collect more information on our cases and their contacts. 
It will help us ensure we're on top of every case and collecting the data we need to inform Restart Vermont. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we'll open up for questions. All right, we'll start in the room with Calvin. Thank you. Um, the Joint Physical Office last night um, presented a report basically forecasting next year we're going to lose, I think it's up to about $430 uh, million of revenue next year. Um, it's going to take a lot, of course, to, to fill that hole. Um, what, uh, what are you thinking in terms of right now? What, what resources will have? Well, again, uh, I've been talking about this for a while over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we need to, to figure out what the magnitude of the problem is before we start spending money in any area and uh, before we contemplate how we're going to fill those holes or what we're going to do without. So this is a good first step. I know Secretary Young is on the phone as well. Uh, she might be able to add to this. I think she was part of the, uh, the discussion over the last couple of days. Secretary Young? Uh, thank you, Governor. I'm not quite sure I heard the gist of the question about, um, is it about the revenues? It, it was about the, uh, joint, the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, had oh. anticipated a 400 and something million dollar um, deficit or, or hole in the budget uh, for next year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Governor. There have been some evolving numbers uh, on a weekly basis uh, from this, the legislative economist uh, and as of April 28th, uh, the total down in the FY20s that he has predicted was about 309, and that was really a, a number that's substantially less than what they were predicting earlier. Um, so that's the 20 picture, and we're working uh, with those numbers as they evolve and waiting to see the final April numbers. Um, as far as, uh, is, does that answer your question? Go ahead. Yeah, well, I guess if I just had a follow-up, too, so, you know, we'll have to explore new streams of revenue and potentially make cuts. Uh, what would the administration look at uh, if, if we did have to cut things? Well, again, I think you have to look across the board. Uh, this is a huge uh, issue that we're facing, many states are facing. We're still not sure what the federal government's going to do at this point, either. I've heard uh, other governors uh, and uh, our congressional delegation talking about possibly the opportunity of having some relief there uh, to fill some of these gaps, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, we have to plan for the worst. Uh, we're going to uh, have to present, first of all, we have to take care of uh, fiscal year 20, uh, which is going to end at the end of uh, June. So with all the projections coming in at this point in time, addressing that deficit comes first. Uh, and I know that we're, we're talking with the legislature about how do we move forward? Are we going to do this in you know, a three-month increment, uh, for instance, for fiscal year 21, which starts July 1. So there are a number of different ways uh, of addressing this. Uh, we're asking our cabinet to, uh, again, uh, look from within. What is it that we, you know, what prioritize, what our, what our needs are, what we, what we can do without. And uh, we're just going to have to work at this together because there's no simple answer uh, to this. This is going to be incredibly difficult. And this is compounded. It's not just uh, the general fund. It's the education fund, you know, the transportation fund. All are going to see uh, tremendous opportunities, tremendous holes. And then you take your municipal budgets as well. Uh, so it's everything's coupled together has, uh, has created, uh, again, uh, a, a very vast uh, deficit uh, throughout the, throughout the uh, state. And that's why it's so important for us to try and get people back to work uh, and trying to get the economy rolling again. So we'll be talking a little bit about that on, on Friday, but <clears throat> all the things we're doing today, even the, the, the tracing and, and, tra uh, and, and uh, testing uh, is going to be important so that we can measure as we move along, how can we continue to, to put people back to work without creating harm to others? Stuart? If I could follow up on the getting back to work thing. I'm, you've spoken repeatedly about coordinating with other governors. Yesterday, Governor Mills outlined a four-phase plan, very specific, starting Friday in Maine, barbershops, hair salons, golf courses, hunting, fishing, state parks. I mean, it was a very specific list starting in two days. 
Does that inform what you're willing to do here, given the similarities uh, across northern New England? Uh, can, can you give us any? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, every every state is different, uh, and I look at uh, and I. We've been in contact with uh, Governor Mills and Governor Sununu, uh, in fact, Governor Baker this morning. Governor Baker is in a much different situation than others. Uh, he said this morning, you're not going to see much opening up in our state for quite some time. Um, Governor Mills is different, uh, you know, in, uh, in terms of they have a, you think about uh, their shared borders. They have a shared border with Canada, which is closed right now, uh, so that's protected. Uh, they have a, uh, the other border uh, with the Atlantic which is fairly well protected. Uh, their other is with uh, New Hampshire and very little uh, in the southern uh, part of the state, uh, which is where they, uh, they will see, see the most uh, issue. Uh, they're also, and, and I don't know all the details uh, of their plan, um, but, uh, but I believe she's talking about, uh, and, and I don't, we're not sure constitutionally whether this is, uh, this is even doable, but I think she's restricted most of this to residents only, uh, not to anyone coming into the state. So how do you protect that? You know, what happens when somebody comes in? If you open up your golf courses, you open up your state parks, you open up your beaches, uh, and, and you just, and you say it's just for your residents, how are you going to, what are you going to do when somebody comes across the line and goes to your, your beach and they're from Massachusetts or they're from New Hampshire, or they're from Vermont? Are they going to be cited? I just don't know enough of the details. So you can see there's all kinds of ramifications We've taken a different path uh, here from the very beginning. Uh, we've been more restrictive, uh, and, uh, and our, our tracing and testing program has been uh, much more um, vibrant than others. Uh, if you look, we've been you know in the top 10 since the almost the beginning in terms of testing. And with this uh, provision we're outlining today, uh, this will shoot us up, I would believe, into the top five. But we think this is a strategy that works, and if we can. If we can prove this out, uh, we can start opening up the economy uh, that, uh, that makes sense for us uh, while protecting Vermonters by continuing to, to, to trace and track. Um, so this is just the, the way we're doing things. Again, we're, we're, uh, we're contemplating all the above as well, uh, but our focus really is on the major sectors and how do we get those uh, back going again. If I could follow up, uh, you didn't mention that we had zero new positive today yeah I don't remember when that's been true yeah no that's uh, that great great news um, but one one day uh, doesn't create a trend uh, and we have to look at the trend lines to see where we're going but this is great news uh, again for us and it gives me uh, a little bit of uh, support and comfort in some of the measures we'll talk about on on Friday but as I've said we're going to keep watching the the data and the science and make our decisions based on that uh, not on not on public pressure, and I, the public pressure is immense. And I know it was for Governor Mills, I know it is for other governors throughout the country, but um, from my standpoint, I, I, you know, I'll take the pressure, uh, but what I can't take is uh, looking into the eyes of uh, a family member who's been harmed in some way or lost uh, due to the action that we took. On the labor side, Governor, uh, we've gotten a few correspondence from folks who were on the waiting list, they got their 1200 bucks, uh, but they were found to not be eligible for the other uh, unemployment uh, stuff. And, and they're wondering, do they have to uh, return that money, or if they don't have to return that money, do they, is, is that some sort of income that they have to report on their income tax? They are, they're kind of confused. Yeah, I don't know the uh, specifics of that. Um, maybe I would refer to Commissioner Harrington if he's on the on the line, um, but I'm not sure. Is that see? There's there is some confusion as well because some people are probably getting notices that they don't um, uh, they aren't able to uh, to take uh, advantage of the traditional unemployment, uh, so they've been turned down for that. But they may uh, qualify for the PUA, which is this new program that Congress created. So there may be confusion there, but I'm just not sure. Uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, sure, thank you, Governor. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, every case is unique uh, in terms of whether someone is eligible for traditional UI or pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and so in these cases, if someone um, may have been found to be uh, not monetarily eligible for traditional UI, uh, 
but would be eligible under uh, pandemic unemployment assistance. So um, if, if they are, are determined to be eligible for one or the other program, um, there is a mechanism for recapturing uh, that $600 uh, times two uh, that was sent out in the check. Um, you know, I think we'll handle the unique cases where someone may not be eligible for both. Um, however, I think those will be um, in a much smaller category. Uh, those who are not monetarily eligible for traditional UI but are potentially eligible for PUA, um, you know, there are still a couple outliers there, groups of people um, that we are working to put into the uh, essentially uh, transition over into the PUA system. So they um, may also be hearing from the department, uh, you know, in a matter of a day or so as to the status and, and next steps. All right, we're going to go to the phones for the callers. I just want to let you know there are 20 uh, callers with questions on the line, so please keep that in mind um, when, you, when you're when you asking your questions. Uh, Wilson Ring, AP. Um, hi, as always, thank you. Um, Stuart preempted me by asking about the no new cases. That was going to be one of my two questions. Um, but I also noticed that there hasn't been, I mean, it's kind of a follow-up. I have two questions. There seems, it has, there hasn't been a fatality for a week, uh, which would seem to be another piece of good news. Um, my second and broader question is the testing system that, th that you're working to roll out over the next several weeks, is that something you developed here in Vermont among yourselves, or is this something you work with other uh, epidemiology professionals to do, or uh, uh, did you get any guidance from the federal government to do it, or, or basically is it all in-house? And uh, that's my question. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Levine answer that. I, I would have to say probably all of the above, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer. And, and please don't let me take away the fact that you feel really good about the statistic that just came out, but I will piggyback on the governor's comment. A day does not make a trend, um, and we're in this for the long ball, um, and we really have to watch trends, watch data on a daily basis, watch for the projected resurgences of disease, and everything we've outlined today is to help us get through those future periods. Um, with regard to the development of the testing, it's really, it's really been, uh, as I mentioned, very strategic. Um, there isn't a tremendous amount of federal guidance in uh, the approach one takes. The guidance is more increase your numbers. That's been the focus uh, from a national standpoint. Um, many, many parts of the country have not even been able to test all of those who are symptomatic. Um, forget about the asymptomatic and other vulnerable groups, they haven't even had the capacity to test the symptomatic. We've been blessed by being able to do that all along, and we want to continue to maintain that capacity. But we do want to be very, very strategic. And by being strategic, I mean really looking at groups that would benefit the most from having this additional testing on board and uh, help us with all of these future efforts in terms of reducing an impact on the healthcare system, improving our ability uh, to sequentially and in a phased way restart Vermont and uh, deal with all of the kinds of uh, har harsh policies that we've had to be living under that uh, people are uh, tiring of, but at the same time been very cooperative with and wanting to um, have us ease up on. So, this is all really done from a very um, evidence and science-based standpoint. Um, not tremendous amount of guidance from the outside in terms of the federal government. Certainly uh, the CDC, uh, we're always in communication with, and uh, they're a good uh, sounding board, if you will, for some of the things we come up with. Um, and this was really, you know, within the health sector of state government, but also across sectors in state government um, in our ability to really work as a team and be strategic. Is that an answer to your question? It does. Thank you very much, as always. Um, 
two, two things I'd, I'd like to add uh, as well. When we talk about trends, and it is good news that we just had uh, zero uh, positives as of today, um, but uh, that doesn't create a trend, nor does if we, and my prediction is, as we open up the economy, if we have more people going to work, as we, uh, again, ease up on some of these restrictions, I believe we're going to see more positive cases. So that doesn't create a trend either. Uh, and what we need to do is manage uh, that level. And that's why we're doing this tracing and, and, and testing uh, and becoming so heavily involved and taking a more proactive approach uh, because we want to make sure that we, we control that. Uh, so I predict that we'll see more, uh, but that's, that's something that we have to consider as we open up this picket a little bit more. Um, as well, uh, Stuart, I didn't finish my, uh, my thoughts on the border issues in Maine and so forth. You know, we're in a different position uh, than Maine because we're just, <clears throat> depending on where you are in Vermont, we're just uh, 100 miles or less away from the epicenter right now, uh, which is in the Massachusetts area, Boston area. They're still going through this. Uh, they've had 400 deaths, uh, over 400 deaths over the last uh, four days. Uh, as well, New York isn't done. I mean, they had, I believe, over 1,200 deaths uh, over the last uh, three or four days as well. So right within reach of us is a problem area. And we may have zero positives today, but it only takes that one ember uh, to get across into Vermont uh, that would explode, it, uh, explode the numbers and increase our numbers dramatically. So that's what we have to pay attention to, just because of our proximity. All right, Greg, the county courier. Hi, Governor. Um, my question is about the agricultural community. Um, with milk prices drastically declining, I'm wondering what your administration is doing to support farmers and in, in the ag community in Vermont. <clears throat> um, and specifically, what would you what would you say to those who are uh, relying on agriculture for their livelihood? It's it's not like farmers can just stop milking and yeah. and you know go on unemployment. Yeah, I'm very concerned about agriculture, and I know that there was some news out of uh, out of Congress in, in terms of assistance and aid for them of late. But that doesn't uh, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, again, uh, like other uh, sectors, uh, take our state colleges. Uh, agriculture was in a bit of uh, trouble before this pandemic, and this has not helped them at all. I'm I'm very concerned about the farmers themselves. I'm concerned about our food supply, um, and we need to protect that. It is on our list. Uh, I know uh, Secretary Temp Tebbets has been uh, talking with us about some uh, type of program uh, that, uh, that might provide relief and something we should consider. Uh, again, it's in the list of things that uh, we're, where we need to, to provide assistance, but we don't, again, know the magnitude of the problem uh, at this point and where the money, the resources would come from. Um, so I don't want to overpromise, uh, but uh, we're not ignoring this, uh, and they're too valuable for, to us. They're part of our tradition and culture, and we want to do everything we can to protect them because they protect us. Uh, one of our basic needs is, is our food supply, and as we've seen across the country with other uh, meatpacking plants and so forth, they are they are essential to us in, in numerous ways. So again, uh, we'll just. My message would be, hang in there. Um, we're going to do everything we can to support them, um, but this is a, a very trying time for them. Uh, you say they're on the list. Are they high on the list? What what comes before them on the list? Yeah, every, everything is on the list. I don't think there's a priority in terms of the, the number of demands that we have in all sectors uh, in, in trying to Again, uh, contemplate what resources are available to help, making sure we get them to those who already have them available, and uh, and then find out what is it we can do uh, with the, some of the resources we have available at this point in time. So I would not uh, I would not uh, prioritize this list in any respect. They're all important to us, and uh, we're we're doing everything we can to help everyone. Thanks, Governor. Ken Picard, seven days. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking my call. This is uh, this is a question for either Dr. Levine or Dr. Kelso. Um, I saw an estimate this week from uh, NPR that 
put the need for contact tracers at about 30 for every 100,000 people in the state which would mean that we would need probably more than 180 here in Vermont. Um, I'm wondering if you folks are planning to ramp up the number of contact tracers we have, and if so, where you expect them to be coming from. Dr. Kelso, are you still with us? Yes, I'm, ha I'm happy to take that one. Um, thanks for the question. We know that contract Contact tracing does take a ton of work. We currently have 53 staff on our team who have been trained and doing this work for weeks now. Um, they've, they're well on top of the burden of illness that we've been seeing, but as the governor has, and the commissioner have said, we do expect that to increase. Um, we have a plan to ramp up 40 or 50 additional, additional staff to the contact tracing team if necessary. And based on our calculations of each staff person managing two new cases and all of their contacts every day, we think we're prepared with that number for the, the worst case scenario, should we see that. Okay, um, and just a quick follow-up. Um, you mentioned that um, we're going to uh, an electronic system, the SARA Alert. Uh, could you say something a little bit more about that and um, how this is being done to also protect the sort of privacy and confidentiality of uh, Vermonters? Sure, I can say a little bit more about the system and then uh, turn it over to our ADS colleagues who can speak to the security. Um, the system, what we've been doing is reaching out to every case, um, doing an interview to find out who they were around while they were potentially infectious so that we could then do contact tracing on them and for cases also providing information about um, how they need to stay in isolation until their symptoms have resolved and they can get back um, out, out of isolation. Um, and then with the contacts, we've been providing them information on uh, what they need to do to quarantine for what period of time. And again, um, if they need resources um, where they can reach out and what they should do if they develop symptoms during their quarantine. What this Thera Alert system will enable us to do is be in daily contact with contacts and with cases, um, to be more on top of them on a, on a daily basis and getting information as their situations may evolve. And then I'll turn it over to ADS for the te more technology questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Kelso. This is Kristen McClure, I'm the Chief Data Officer. So regarding data security and privacy, uh, this will be maintained through encrypting data at rest as well as in transit. And it'll also be maintained through role-based access control. So certain roles will only have certain access to specific data that they need to perform that function. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Kat, WCAX. We've talked a lot here about turning the economic spigot. I know many people are wondering, though, when we can turn the social spigot, because staring at a screen to talk with someone on Zoom or Skype is not the same as seeing them in person. However, on Monday, I believe I wrote down a quote from Dr. Levine that said social distancing is here to stay. So my question is, when can people have what they would consider normal gatherings again? You know, things like having friends for, over for barbecues as the weather gets nicer or the kids' friends over for play dates. Is that going to be after May 15th, or should people expect that they can't get together with others in person for the whole summer? Yeah, uh, again, I think what we're going to do is rely on the data again and seeing where the trending is uh, is occurring. Putting people back to work right now is our, our primary effort. Uh, and seeing what happens as a result of that. Um, but we are fully aware and, uh, and sensitive uh, to the fact that we need to socially integrate more. We need to get to see our family, get to see our friends and so forth. And we want to put everyone back together as quick as possible. Um, but, uh, but again, our primary fo focus, at least for this week, is to, uh, to try and get more people back to work. Uh, and then uh, next week, we'll take a look again uh, seeing what the trends uh, are doing, uh, what uh, what the um, what the trajectory looks like, and then make determinations based on that. Uh, and as you mentioned, 
the 15th is when the uh, stay home stay order uh, officially ends but uh, we'll be contemplating what to do next and uh, and how that would uh, interact but we want to ease restrictions just as quick as we can but it has to be safe in order to do so so i have a follow-up to that then um is it going to be difficult to continue to get buy-in from people when they don't have a sense of when it will be over well again uh, i think we've been fairly measured i think uh, been uh, having these press conferences uh, three times a week uh, trying to provide information from our uh, cabinet and, and others, uh, experts and so forth, uh, to try and be transparent uh, about what we're doing, what we're seeing, and uh, how we're doing. Um, and for those who are watching, uh, again, we want to do this as quickly as we can, as safely as we can, uh, without doing harm to others. Uh, and so um, we'll continue to do that. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm I'm concerned uh, about uh, people complying with the measures as we put people back to work. It's up to, to them, uh, I would say. I mean, I'm going to put it back on individuals as well. If you're not complying, if you're going back to work, and if you're uh, in those settings where you're not wear wearing a mask and you're not socially distancing, uh, you're only hurting the cause. Uh, and that's going to result in increased numbers, uh, and, and that would would preclude us from uh, from getting back to some sort of normal. So it's in all of our hands. I talk about this a lot, uh, making sure that we're wearing a mask when we're out, uh, socially distancing, uh, you know, to stay apart, separated from each other, um, as well as uh, as uh, just, uh, you know, disinfecting and, and keeping things clean and being aware of what you're doing. So um, if you do all that, uh, we'll we'll get back to normal much quicker. Uh, than if you um, defy everything that we're providing for guidance. Last follow-up on this particular idea. So there's this idea that has come up several times at these press conferences about there being a 10-person limit on gatherings. Can you clarify who that rule is intended for and how it fits in with a stay-home, stay-safe order? Well, again, that was uh, something that we came to the conclusion uh, late. Uh, we had started at whatever it was, 150, then down to 10, based on federal guidance. Uh, and, uh, and so we have uh, maintained that. So uh, we're just trying to, again, guide people into uh, making sure that we don't, uh, we don't exceed that, whether it's at the, at the greenhouses that we've uh, opened back up uh, or any uh, gatherings uh, that we've opened back up, um, that you don't exceed the limit of 10. Uh, it's just a rule of thumb, so to speak. So, uh, I'm not sure uh, at this point uh, what more I can tell you about that. I guess the clarifying question is this is a, that is directed then at businesses and not at individuals who are at, in their own home. Yeah, well, at this point, yes, that's right. It's, uh, it's more for those uh, situations where uh, people can gather, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's in business settings or whether it's in any of the uh, the uh, guidance that we provided where we've opened up different sectors, um, just trying to, pre to prevent people from gathering uh, more than 10. All right, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, thank you, good morning. Um, I've been getting some word this week that some Vermonters could return to work if they had daycare, and I'm just wondering, and they, are they wondering, what can be done to help those um, individuals if you're going to allow daycares to open? And if they can't op if they can't return to work, do they potentially have, uh, will they lose their jobs? And can they continue on unemployment? Yeah, um, let me just say broadly uh, that this is on our radar screen. Again, as we open up businesses and open up jobs and open up the economy, uh, we know this is a factor that might prevent someone from going back to work. And I do believe uh, there's uh, an exemption in the unemployment uh, rules that would allow people to continue to, to uh, qualify for unemployment uh, benefits if they didn't have childcare. But uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner Harrington answer that. Uh, yes, uh, great question and, and very timely. So uh, the department uh, is and does have information on its website regarding what we're calling refusal to return to work. Um, in those cases uh, where an employer has offered an employee the ability to come back to work 
at their normal pay and their normal hours. Um, there are a couple of exemptions uh, to that. Um, one being uh, if the person is sick, if the person themselves is sick or isolated, um, if there is unreasonable or undue risk of exposure uh, within the place of employment, if they're caring for a family member who is sick or isolated, or if they're caring for a child who's out of school or does not have child care. Um, and so under those exemptions, they could continue to collect uh, unemployment insurance benefits. However, um, if one of those exemptions does not apply uh, and they are being offered full-time work at their regular rate of pay um, or their, or at least the number of hours that is um, uh, what they left the workplace with, um, then there, there is an obligation on the claimants to have to accept that work and go back to work. Uh, and if they refuse to go back to work, uh, they're jeopardizing their eligibility for benefits. Under the conditions, if the employer can't return to work for what we just spoke about, for example, lack of child care, can the employer consider that, um, uh, consider the, a fi they, a fi they uh, quit from their job, I'm sorry? Uh, great question. It is a question that is before our legal counsel. Um, in terms of whether that could be considered a quit. Uh, and again, I think, you know, we're, we're constantly pushing towards education, voluntary compliance, and trying to be um, as understanding, uh, both on the claimant, but also the employer side, uh, as much as possible, that there are people who are in these positions. Um, again, it, this is an at-will state, um, so they could choose to uh, terminate that person. Not sure they could consider it a quit. Um, but again, that may mean that because they terminated this person, um, we'd have to look into the legality of, of being uh, having that have an impact on their experience rating or not. Okay, thank you. And I have a second qu uh, quick question, if I may. Um, we've heard some about a second round of this that might be coming up towards the fall and winter. Are we looking at another round of complete closure, or is it too early to tell? Yeah, I think it's way too early to tell. Uh, I know that Dr. Fauci, I've heard it on the national level, I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer this as well, but we've seen uh, that there is uh, concern about the second wave coming, but we don't know that to be uh, the fact at this point, um, but we have to prepare for that at the same time, which is why we're taking some of the steps we're taking. Uh, I think we'll be, if there, a second round comes, we'll be much more prepared for it than we were before. There's so many advances in testing and and antibodies and so forth uh, that are coming about each and every day. Uh, hopefully, we'll be in a position where we can deal with this much more effectively that we don't have the shutdowns that we've had before. But we don't know uh, at this point in time. And again, uh, everything we're doing today is to prevent that from happening in the fall. Dr. Levine. Yes, thank you. Um, most of the public health community believes there will be some kind of resurgence. Again, that doesn't mean what we've just been through as a state and as a country. Uh, it could be a far reduced level. It's a nice question to ask today as we unveil our new testing strategy because that's the one place where the state nor the country was poised for action as we entered this COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic. Um, and I don't have to go through the stories regarding why that was true uh, in terms of the supply issues uh, as a country and the, and the approach. Now that we have that approach, we have the capacity, we will have a little stockpile as well, uh, we will be able to enter a period of resurgence if that's what we're destined for, and I'm not making that a guarantee. Um, we'll be able to enter that period of resurgence with a containment strategy already in effect. The country missed the opportunity for containment and had to go straight to social distancing and all of these non-pharmaceutical interventions that we are now living with. Um, doesn't mean that those wouldn't need to come back at a more modest level, but at the same time, we have the opportunity to contain the virus now. And I, and I didn't say it as specifically, and I'll say it now, many of the populations that we've been talking about testing, some of whom we've tested to some degree already, are essentially asymptomatic populations. So you're actually finding people 
who in a pre-symptomatic state could be capable of infecting others, and you're finding them very early on doing containment with them and with those that you contact trace. So the opportunity for that curve to go as high as we have projected for the initial experience with the virus is much more limited and, tamp and hampered and dampened down, if you will. Uh, and the opportunity for that curve to come close to exceeding the capacity of the healthcare system to deal with it is much more dampened as well. So all of this is a way of saying that if it does come, it will probably be less severe than the first go-round, and we will be poised to do a lot more containment. There are some public health, uh, uh, I'll call them experts in the country, um, who do see uh, these mitigation strategies like social distancing as something that gets turned on and then turned off, turned on, turned off, periodically over periods of time, uh, knowing that this won't be the last time we see COVID-19. Uh, it's still a novel virus for the human race. Uh, so it remains to be seen if, if some of those predictions would be true or not true. It's really hard to, to guess on that count. Uh, because again, starting with containment, you've already got a much more strong fighting chance to deal with things and hopefully don't need to bring in as many of the other strategies that we've all been seeing uh, evolve over the last uh, one or two months. Thank you. All right, Patricia Bennington Banner. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay. I'm wondering if this might be a question for Dr. Levine uh, or the governor, depending on who. I'm wondering how confident are you that the state has the essential supplies for this increased testing? I assume probably. Uh, pretty confident because you guys plan to roll this out. And how did this increased testing capacity come about? I would imagine it's probably too early for it to have come from the increased testing funding provided in the uh, bill that was signed into law last week. So I'm wondering, yeah, how did you get this testing capacity and how confident are you in it? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm confident because uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso uh, have said that, that we have the supplies necessary to do this. So I rely on the experts for that. And I'll let Dr. Levine answer the rest. Gives me an opportunity to do my um, testing from A to Z course in one minute or less. Um, so to do a, a optimal testing is a, a very complicated process, actually. Um, the reason we've been able to get to this point is through resourcefulness, frank, frankly, and creativity. Um, and working multiple supply chains, working with multiple uh, federal partners and private partners. But to do testing, first of all, the person has to be involved with the healthcare system and have a test order provided. That order needs to include a location, and we certainly have locations throughout the state, and we've shown our capability to pop up locations when needed in times of uh, need. At that location, one needs personnel who can obtain the test from the patient. Depending on the type of test you're obtaining, you may need a sophisticated level of PPE. You need a collection swab, something to stick in the nose or in the mouth, or um, depending on which test you're using. You then need to put that swab in something Think of it as like a test tube or a little container that has some kind of media that the virus can live in so that when you eventually do your laboratory test, the virus is transported in a way that it's viable still and we can detect it. You need to transport that media to wherever the testing location is under the right circumstances, which may require some temperature uh, regulation may require some sophisticated uh, materials to package it in, then gets to a laboratory. First it gets to a triage center at the University of Vermont, and then it gets to the laboratory it's going to be evaluated in. There you need what's called an extraction kit, because this is a nucleic acid-based assay, and we want to get the RNA type of nucleic acid out of the uh, sample. Then you need to have a PCR 
step, which is the step that actually detects the virus as COVID-19 and not some other type of virus based on its RNA's genetic code. So you need that set of reagents and chemicals as well. So it's a very sophisticated process, requires uh, really a supply chain across a whole host of uh, areas. And we're very confident that we not only have that supply in, in hand now, and we have some element of a stockpile, but that we'll be able to get more. But we are always challenged by this, and it sort of goes if you've been burned once, you're always conscious of something. And as a country, we were in such a tentative place six weeks ago or seven weeks ago that we don't want to be burned again. So we've been looking not just at a platform of testing, but multiple platforms of testing at our public health lab, at our UVM lab, at the commercial labs that we send out of state. Uh, they're actually all on very different kinds of analyzers, and um, we're you know, very heterogeneous in our approach to make sure that no one pathway gets shut down and the whole operation suffers. Likewise, on the collection side, um, we have capacity within our labs at public health and at UVM to produce all of what we need there, but we have to have our eye on that ball all the time. And in just six weeks, seven weeks, this whole technology is changing as we speak. So right now, we are hoping to use nasal swabs, which are a little more patient-friendly and comfortable, but it turns out right now you can't use them for people who have no symptoms. So we have to use the other uh, types of swabs. But there's talk about using saliva. There's talk about testing that can be done you know, on the scene in point of care versus in a laboratory. Um, and different kinds of technology that may require less um, materials than what we've been using now, and certainly less PPE to uh, protect the healthcare worker than we're using now, depending again on how the samples are obtained. So we just watch that with great interest and uh, are on top of it all the time so that as innovations occur, uh, we can take advantage of them and hopefully reduce that complexity that I just uh, illustrated for you all. Thank you, Doctor. All right, Joe Barton Chronicle. Hello, I believe this is a question for Commissioner Harrington. Um, we at the Chronicle have been speaking with a number of people in the community who have applied for um, unemployment benefits, and we've had a, a large number of them uh, say that when they applied, they were told that the state didn't recognize their social security number. And some of these people have had the issue resolved, and some of them have not. But even the people who have had it resolved would like to know what happened and why it is the state didn't wasn't able to confirm what is pretty much a universal uh, form of identification. Uh, sure. Um, so a, a point of clarification. So it's not that the state doesn't recognize it. It's that the system did not recognize it. So these were individuals um, who uh, may have applied for general or traditional UI um, and may not have been put into the PUA system yet. Um, it could also be that they had filed a claim, uh, and when they went into um, the, uh, the, the portal, um, if you will, for traditional UI, that either their claim had an issue on it, in which case the portal would not have their claim because it's been held up. Uh, many of those have been resolved. Um, or it could be that they had already filed for a week, and so um, they didn't have any current weeks to file for, and therefore the system would not have them uh, an open file, an open week for them to file. So their um, their social security number may not have been in the portal to recognize them. So there's a whole host of reasons. It's not that the department 
didn't recognize their social security number in its entirety. It's that whatever portion of the system they were going to um, did not have their social security number on file. And that could be one because of an eligibility reason. It could have been because of a technical reason. Um, it could be that, uh, you know, it's a part of the adjudication process. Um, or it could be that they're part of this group um, that will be moving over um, to the new system uh, in the coming days, and then their their social security numbers will actually populate and be found in the system. So um, again, it's it's um, not a social security number issue; it's just the way the the system is designed. Um, just to follow up, I believe these were people who were not applying for the PUA. This was prior to that. These are people who were applying for a traditional, and I think they're concerned wasn't necessarily um, that the claim was held up. I'm sure they were bothered by that, but that they were not given information about what the problem was and what they could do to deal with it, which left them in some degree of anxiety. So uh, I, I do want to point out that um, we have sent uh, information to those people that we have email addresses for with regards to when they get the notice that their Social Security number is not found. Uh, we also have that information on our website on the home page. Um, you know, so again, we are when we hear of these situations and especially if we hear of a, a significant portion of the population with a reoccurring issue, um, we are trying multiple methods to reach out to people to let them know that either it's a system issue that we're working to correct or that it is just part of the process and here's what they need to do as a follow-up. Um, so I do know that we have uh, emailed claimants um, information of, about what to do when their Social Security number is not recognized. We also have posted that information on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Wallace-Allen, Digger. Hi, um, my question is about lodging properties. Some of them do in fact seem to be taking reservations um, for before June 15th and some in one case on, on May 15th. And I was wondering either maybe something has changed that I hadn't um, known about or is this, um, is this allowed or, or, or are they supposed to wait till June 15th? Um, our guidance had said June 15th. Um, if they were in the system before, uh, it wasn't as though we'd asked them to take them out, but uh, but we had asked them to mm -hmm. stop taking reservations. So I'm not I'm not clear as to what the issue is uh, in this regard, but um, but our guidance had said uh, the 15th of June. So that means that they could in fact have guests who are coming and staying um, if they had made a reservation before to come on May 15th, for example, they could still come. Well, again, I, I'm not sure the specifics of that, but uh, anybody coming into the state, if they're coming from out of state, uh, would have to quarantine for 14 days. So if they had a reservation for 14 days, um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, whether they would be allowed to, to come or not um, under those conditions. But most of our lodging properties are, are closed at this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, that leads me to my other question, um, which is that a few weeks ago, I know that the Department of Public Safety was um, was starting to go and talk to businesses that were open when they shouldn't be. And I was just wondering, has there been any enforcement action taken against any business in Vermont for being open um, in violation of the executive orders? I'm going to ask if uh, Commissioner Sherling might be on the line. I know the Attorney General had talked about uh, citations and so forth, but uh, Commissioner Sherling? Yes, sir. Uh, there's, uh, we're not aware of any direct enforcement action that's been taken by the Attorney General. There are uh, a number of uh, reports that have been referred uh, over there for review. And again, the hope was that uh, a renewed educational effort uh, reinforced by the AG's uh, team would, uh, would solve the problems. So, and, and uh, uh, bottom line is maybe a, a contact, maybe calling the Attorney General might get your answer. Yeah. Um, okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Mike, Newport Daily Express. 
Uh, yes, hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to veer off topic just for a quick moment. I have two quick questions. Um, the first, uh, Governor, can you speak to uh, Jeb Spaulding's uh, upcoming uh, resignation this evening? Yeah, um, you know, I, I can't say that I'm surprised by the action, uh, but I would uh, I would also offer that, uh, that Jeb has done a, a had a long history of public service. Uh, in fact, he was a Washington County Senator before I was. I took his seat after he decided not to run. Um, and then he became treasurer, uh, was well respected, uh, did a lot of great work in that regard, and became uh, chancellor uh, after a stint with the Shumlin administration. Um, I've always had a great relationship with him, a great deal of respect for him, uh, and, uh, and I know his heart is in the right place. Uh, he um, uh, had done, taken on this issue with the state colleges. This was not of his doing. Uh, he had come to me a number of times uh, saying that we have a problem, and that's why I included uh, funding in my budgets over the last three to four years uh, for just that reason, uh, because he convinced me that we did indeed had a, have a problem. Um, so um, I, uh, it's unfortunate uh, we're in the position we're in. Uh, this was not, again, his doing, uh, this, uh, and this was uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, uh, where they were struggling, and uh, COVID-19, unfortunately, was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. So uh, other colleges, universities throughout the country are facing this very same issue. Um, I think we're going to see a sea change uh, throughout the country in terms of uh, higher education and, and what it means in the future. Um, so, and we'll see others uh, falling as well. So we'll, um, we'll see what happens. But again, I, I want to make sure that I, I don't believe that Jeb Spaulding was the blame for this. I think that he, he did all he could. He was a, a huge supporter of the Vermont State College system. And uh, any of the events that I attended, uh, well, he was a uh, chancellor. Uh, he was always uh, um, rising to the occasion to try and elevate uh, the state college system and do all he could to protect it. Um, my second question goes back to the topic at hand, uh, COVID-19. I was uh, reviewing some footage last night of uh, what our current administration at the uh, federal level has been doing uh, during this. And this is a direct quote from the President of the United States. When governors call me, they say, thank you. You are the greatest president that's ever lived, end quote. Um, I'm wondering, A, and I, I, I know, take this with a grain of salt. Have you heard of any governors saying this? Or B, why would the president say something like this? I, I can't answer either one of those questions. Um, I would say that there are a number of governors throughout the country who are very uh, big supporters of the president, uh, many who aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know why any, why he would say that. Okay, thank you for your time, Governor. I appreciate it. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Levine. In the past, you've spoken about antiviral therapeutics, and it would seem that those would be would make reopening the economy that much easier. Can you speak to how these are developed and what the outlook is for having them become available? Sure. So there are a number of antiviral drugs that are actually already in use and on the market. Um, one that has been showing, I will put the word slight in front of it, slight promise, is called remdesivir. Um, again, these are being used for the sickest of the sick, people in intensive care quite generally, uh, in hospitals. But the whole field of antiviral therapeutics goes beyond specific drugs. Uh, it also goes through you know, strategies, if you will, for treating people. Generally, again, we're talking about those who are the very ill and not people on the mild end of the spectrum. So uh, one press conference a while back, I got a question about prone positioning, whether the person be on a ventilator or not on a ventilator. Um, and early use of oxygen, and this is still, you know, actively being studied, but prone positioning has been uh, a portion of intensive care for quite a while, uh, often with patients who have what we call 
acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Um, and it's being used in this virus because often that is a final common pathway as ARDS related to the virus. There's also trials that are ongoing regarding the donation of people's plasma, people who have had the infection and now want to try to do some good, donating plasma that could be used to help quiet down the infection in people who are again very ill. These are being done in clinical trial settings, so it's not just the first thing people jump to doing to treat somebody who's ill with COVID, but it's clearly as part of a clinical investigation and uh, another important strategy. I don't have, I don't want to give false uh, hope to any particular pathway, except to say that all of this is being done, like everything with COVID, on a very compressed time frame, and. We're hoping to see some results of trials. These kinds of trials and these kinds of uh, novel therapeutics, I'll call them, are, are going to be tested a lot faster than a vaccine. Um, and, be, if, and if they prove uh, useful, to uh, certainly go uh, in front of the public a lot quicker than a vaccine may. You've also heard probably about other older drugs that um, have been talked about a lot in the national news, like uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, azithromycin. Um, these are, again, drugs that do not have a prominent role right now. Uh, they're being studied again in this setting. Uh, people are being cautioned about using them and stockpiling them because at the kind of dose levels that would be used, in a state where you're already ill from COVID, uh, they can have some very unanticipated and adverse effects that uh, would not be helpful. So um, I'm, I'm here just to deliver the news, not to give you uh, any false promises or hopes about anything, but it's very active uh, area of study and we have hopes for that. Thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Hi, um, so my question is about schools um, and if we're like if they're planning to reopen in the fall and what that would look like, um, what plans are being made if they come back, will desks be six feet apart? Will cafeterias be closed? Will they not have assemblies? I'm just wondering, you know, what, what's being talked about right now for the fall? Uh, I'll let uh, Secretary French answer that, but I would I would also add that things will be vastly different, I would imagine, when uh, when and if that happens. Secretary French? Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Um, yes, it's a little early to uh, address that. Um, we are working uh, now on producing guidance for next week on end of this school year and uh, end of year celebrations and graduations. Um, even in formulating that guidance, we're largely relying on the public health uh, information to uh, make a projection on the next six weeks, let alone the next couple of months. But um, you know, it's too early to, to uh, address that, but we will, you know, large large part of that will depend on how the virus uh, tracks and our ability to manage it. Thank you. It's Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Governor, you've talked a lot about uh, what's happening in Boston and New York before that. How much is that guiding uh, the reopening of Vermont more than what's actually happening in Vermont? At this point, and I have a follow-up to. Yeah, well, a great deal in some respects because, it, it, again, as we open up our borders, open up travel into Vermont, uh, this could have ramifications here, and uh, that's what you know. My biggest fear is that we'll have uh, a few of those embers come into the state and then erupt, and we're not prepared for them, and then we have a uh, full-blown uh, pandemic right in our own backyard. So. Um, we're just watching this, uh, and again, they're on the. And, and I'm in contact with uh, uh, Governor Baker on a regular basis. Uh, it does appear that they're plateauing, uh, maybe falling, uh, plateauing, maybe uh, even seeing some uh, relief, reduced numbers. So that's good news. As we've seen in New York City, uh, numbers are starting to drop. But but again, I just want to emphasize that uh, they're still seeing a number of deaths. Uh, they're still seeing positive cases. Uh, so this isn't over for them, and they are literally in our backyard. Uh, the the follow-up, Governor, is 
Do you have a go or no go date on things like um, uh, Ann mentioned before the the um, hospitality and the lodging institutions, or even the colleges, both of which uh, bring in a lot of out of staters? Is, is there a, a time frame when you might say uh, that the colleges will be allowed to uh, reopen? I, I I wouldn't say that there's a a date uh, at this point in time. There's a, not a, a go no go uh, date. It's uh, for us. It it really is about tracking this, and making sure that we're making decisions based on the data we're seeing. And and as we, again, open up that spigot just a little bit more, and we put, you know, a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand uh, people back to work, we're watching to see what effect that will have on the number of positives and so forth. And and so that's why it's really important for us to track this as well as to do what we're doing today announcing more uh, tracing, more testing, uh, so that we can be proactive, play a, a little bit of uh, offense rather than just defense. And, uh, and I think that's part of the answer. And that's why we want to do everything we can uh, to, uh, to do uh, increase uh, amounts of testing and tracing in order to open up more of the sectors so that we can get back to some sort of normal in the future. I was wondering if President Garamella or one of the other college presidents has said, you know, Governor, I need to know by a certain date to let the students know and the staff know if they can come back. Yeah. That, was, that was sort of the basic. Yeah, question. I'm sure there are a lot of questions like that uh, where whether it's the higher education or whether it's the summer camps or whether it's whatever, um, where they need to know at a certain point uh, in order to know uh, or, or even events, um, you know, parades and so forth, to know uh, whether there's any opportunity, any chance at all. Uh, so there's, the list is long on, on those opportunities, and we'll just make the decisions as we, as we can. I don't want to give anybody false hope, uh, but I do want to give people some hope uh, that we are doing the right things, uh, and that we're seeing the benefits of that, and that uh, that will lead to opening up the economy at a much faster rate. Thank you. Colin VT Digger. Hi. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Levine. Can, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, thanks. Um, so the Department of Health reported that in March there were 570 deaths from all causes, which is uh, about 70 more than uh, the average in previous months. Um, other states have reported that uh, March deaths were also beyond their normal total. Do you think the increase could be uh, partly attributable to unreported COVID-19 deaths, uh, given, given that number of COVID-19 deaths in March was significantly less than 70, something more like the mid-30s? Yeah, so that's going to take a lot more scrutiny and statistical analysis than would allow me to just give you an off-the-cuff answer right now. Um, but it is an area that I think has been in the national news, especially in New York and California specifically. Um, and it's something that we need to consider. We, we haven't seen, um, based on information today uh, at the level of the medical examiner, uh, huge increases uh, in total deaths over the course of the whole time period that we might have expected to see if there were a lot of cases that we weren't aware were COVID. Um, but one of the parts of your question is, are some of the deaths that might have been attributed to another cause actually a COVID-related death where the COVID infection stressed out the system in a way that it cause some other underlying disease to appear to be the cause of death, but that might not have killed the person at that time if they didn't have COVID. We're going to have to do a lot more uh, investigation into that to really understand and give you the kind of answer that would be more data-driven and science-based than I can give you off the cuff here. And can you talk a bit about what the process might look like for handling suspicious deaths and whether or not any of that type of uh, post-mortem testing has been done uh, to contribute to the current COVID-19 count? Yeah, so there's a lot of actually post-mortem um, COVID testing that's been done um, in, the, in, in the deaths that have occurred um, 
with a huge index of suspicion now that we're well into this uh, pandemic. Uh, the question about before is a little harder to answer, but certainly now um, it's always considered. Uh, and I think often communities as well as families uh, want to have some idea. So uh, when it's appropriate and it's not that there was an obvious cause of death that clearly wasn't COVID and a person who had no symptoms of COVID, when it's not obvious, uh, the medical examiner has been quite liberal, I would say, in making sure that post-mortem COVID testing is performed. Um, and I have one more follow-up on this issue with Governor Scott. Um, more than half of the deaths in Vermont uh, have been at nursing homes or elder care facilities. And I'm wondering, uh, sort of knowing what we know now, when you look back, do you think that the administration uh, might have acted more swiftly or done anything differently to uh, prevent some of those deaths? I'll, I'll start. Um, if we turn the time clock back and go to like day one of when we knew we had a problem in Vermont, and what needed to be done. Literally, the first, if, if not the very first, certainly in the first slew of uh, policies that came out of the administration and certainly that were recommended was to uh, severely restrict visitation in facilities where the most vulnerable would reside. So uh, that was done so early in the game that um, I, I think you know, we, we did very well in that regard. Um, I do agree with you that a proportion of the deaths uh, that are related to those who resided in some nursing home facilities uh, certainly is significant, and that's a tragic outcome of this COVID epidemic. However, um, if I could make it a half cup full and not half cup empty proposition, we have been very blessed uh, by the fact that we have not seen statewide outbreaks of COVID in a whole host of either long-term care facilities, assisted care facilities, senior high-rise apartments, et cetera. Uh, most states, when you start to really dig down, uh, they'll have perhaps one that's very severely affected and prominent in the news, and then one by one, they'll have other institutions that follow. And um, sooner or later, you find that there's a high proportion of the number of facilities in the state that have been impacted. I'll knock on wood, but I know that has not been uh, the, what we have seen in Vermont at this time. And some of the uh, uh, issues I unveiled in the discussion I had on the new testing policy are only meant to make that even less likely. Uh, in the future. I'll let the governor uh, add to that if he'd like to, or Secretary Smith. I just, I, the only thing I can do is reiterate what uh, Dr. Levine said. When we f first started this, one of the things, and you got to understand how, um, how many lives we affected with this decision when we said no more visitation to these nursing homes and some of these long-term care facilities. We really impacted uh, people's lives when we did that. And we did that to save lives. And so we did that early on when we saw what was going on in Seattle. We've also take, taken the proactive step if there is a positive or um, and we'll be talking about this um, uh, later in terms of, you know, what we're doing with expanded testing. Uh, well, we've already talked about it, what we're doing with expanded testing on those uh, long-term care facilities in terms of our ability to look at them from three to seven to uh, 10 to uh, multiple days that we'll be doing testing on this. I, one of the things that we did in, in the veterans home, you've been reading about in Massachusetts, the tragic result of the veterans home in Massachusetts. Um, we were right on that case uh, when we had an employee that was tested positive a month before and then told uh, about it. We came in and tested the whole facility. So we've been very aggressive with uh, long-term care facilities. With that said, 
we've had two places where tragically uh, we have lost uh, Vermonters in long-term care facilities. But if you if you do what uh, if you to reiterate what the uh, doctor said, if you look across the state um, and you look at other states and what what has happened in other states, um, we've been blessed and uh, and fortunate as we as we look at this. And is it safe to say that as reopening steps occur, that uh, allowing visitation in nursing homes will be one of the last steps? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I think that's going to be the case. That's going to be one of the last steps. You know, that is where we are. That's where testing is focused. That's where the most vulnerable are. Probably will be the last step, Colin. Thank you to both Dr. Levine and uh, Secretary Smith. Um, if I could just add, there's no playbook on this, and it's something that we learn from uh, in every crisis, every emergency, everything we do. Uh, we take whatever we learn from that uh, event and try and do better in the future. And I'm sure that we'll learn a lot from this uh, that we'll be able to utilize in the future as well. After the 27 flood, I'm sure we learned a lot there. After Irene, I know we learned a lot and we prevented uh, some flooding in the future as a result. It'll be no different here. And uh, you have to just go back to where we were in the beginning when we didn't have uh, as much testing capability as we do today. And, uh, and so we want to make sure that we learn from that. And that's why we're doing all the things we're doing today is to make a, a more proactive approach, uh, play offense, and, uh, and trying to do whatever we can to make sure we, we take those smoldering embers and we isolate them and put them out immediately. Right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, just for everybody's awareness, it's about quarter of one and we're only two thirds of the way through the questioners. So, um, Please keep that in mind. Avery, WCAX. Uh, this question is probably either for Governor Scott or Dr. Levine. Um, a reason for the shutdown was so that we didn't overwhelm our hospital capacity, and it, it appears that the strategy now is to have the virus not spread at all. Is that possible to do, and are we prolonging the shutdown longer than we need to? I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer that, uh, but you may want to repeat the question. Could you repeat the sure, question? You can hear me it was okay. a little hard to hear. Um, I think I think I caught it. I think the question was, um, is our goal now to just eliminate spread altogether? Because previously it was set to be uh, just to flatten it enough to not exceed hospital capacity. Right. So we have so we have multiple goals now. Um, we could call the period we're in a period of low viral activity in the population because we're not having a lot of symptomatic people present for tests or have positive tests. And the percentage of tests that are positive now is very, very low. Uh, so part of the strategy is to maintain what we'll call this period of suppression of virus. Another part of the strategy is, though, still to make sure that, using the ember uh, analogy, we make sure that any time virus is discovered, we try to put it out and contain it and make sure that as few Vermonters get affected by it as possible and that um, that containment strategy continue on into the foreseeable future. Another part of the strategy, obviously, when you combine all of that, is eventually going to impact the healthcare system. And so hopefully the healthcare system will see far less uh, severe manifestations of COVID and be open for business in other ways and not have to uh, worry about its capacity being exceeded in the midst of a, a severe outbreak. And then finally, uh, and I think this is a very important one, um, we do want to keep this period of suppression going for a very, very long time so those antiviral therapies we were talking about in a previous question won't even need to come into play, but more importantly, so that if a vaccine gets developed and it's effective and safe to use in the population, we all have the opportunity to receive that vaccine uh, without yeah. having gotten to the point where we were severely ill with COVID in the first place. Does that answer your question? I think you've, I think you've got that. Um, 
Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner Levine. Um, so the first attempt by the health department at uh, town by town numbers uh, proved to be seriously flawed and uh, positive tests were placed in wrong town towns, not only in Swanton and St. Albans, but we're starting to hear from other towns that don't believe the zero to six category used by the state. Uh, Barry Town, Georgia, Middlebury are among those doubting numbers. And we've also heard from Vermonters throughout the state who say they're questioning whether they can now really believe earlier and ongoing COVID stats from the state. So I'm wondering, uh, a couple of people asked, uh, they, they're wondering why out of all the positive tests in Vermont, it seems odd that not one single case involves an out-of-stater. Has the health department assigned them to a town where they were visiting or in the case of a employee like at the prison who lives out of state are they assigned to a town and you touched on this a little bit but public safety and first responders have told me recently they believe the covid death numbers are off they note that a lot of people under medical care at a respite house have died were buried no autopsy aren't those going to be a little hard to check to, as you go back and try to reconfirm these numbers Mike, this is uh, Mike Smith. Let me just, um, I, I've become the cartographer here uh, uh, through no fault of my own, but let me just uh, uh, talk about, the, we're taking another, um, we're refining the map as you, uh, as you have alluded to. Um, there were some prisoners that were um, reported in Swan. That's not the proper town. It should be St. Albans. We're looking at other things. We're also looking at how we can sort of revi refine the zero to six so that we can give people at least a, a, an indication of whether there's been a case within a, a town. So maybe if there isn't a zero, where we may not be able to do that is in Essex County, but we'll, we'll check that out because it's so small of a population, but we'll check that out. In terms of, um, uh, you know, I, I'm going to defend the health department as vigorously as I possibly can in terms of their statistics. They try as much as they possible to get things right. We tried to get um, everything that I've seen from them has been absolutely on the money in terms of what I've seen for statistics and what I've seen for reporting out statistics. This map was an ad hoc uh, sort of uh, trying to respond to various requests that people were making in these press conferences. We will get it right, uh, but it, it, it is a one-off um, adventure that we had not anticipated doing that we're starting to do now. In terms of the deaths, I'll let Dr. Levine talk about the deaths. Yeah, just the two other parts of your question that I could answer. Number one, uh, an out-of-state individual who tests positive for COVID doesn't show up in a town. Uh, they are an out-of-state case. That state actually takes credit for that case. The second part is, if you died in a hospice, like you mentioned a respite house, you're probably in the hospice because you have a very clearly defined and severe terminal illness that um, when you eventually die, which probably is going to be in a matter of days or weeks from the time you arrived, sometimes it's actually hours, uh, it's going to be clear to everyone that your terminal illness is what killed you. However, having said that, just like a judgment is made about a person who has symptoms, should they get a test or not, a judgment is made by a healthcare professional about what goes on the death certificate. And so the death certificate will clearly have the terminal illness on it, but if there's a belief that there was actually another illness on top of that terminal illness that was the straw that broke the camel's back, like a severe infection, that will be listed as the cause of death in, in the setting of having these other chronic illnesses and perhaps terminal illness. 
So um, that, that would be, again, a healthcare professional's judgment at the time they record the death certificate. Okay. Well, you, you, you had mentioned uh, that you do reach out to the hotspots and are uh, working with them. And uh, the Swanton Health Officer told the Islander on Monday that the health department never reported that it was a hotspot, much less that they were number three in the state. Now, granted, the numbers have changed here in the last day or two. But uh, when, when I spoke to the town administrator and the police chief, they also were miffed that they hadn't been told. And uh, if you had reached out, uh, might some of those flaws in the report been caught? And who by name in the health department is responsible for reaching out to these individual towns or hotspots? Uh, and, and where do the local health officers, which are part of your network, fit into this crisis? So when you talk about hotspot, are you talking about a facility or a town? Well, I assume a town uh, of 6,000, when they end up number three on the state list, might be considered a hotspot for right. so, people. So again, the process through our, our epidemiologic infectious disease people is that every case that's recorded there would have an immediate contact would be told what to do for themselves in terms of getting the right health care and isolating themselves and would have contact tracing done at that time. So all of that would actually occur no matter where they are in the state uh, and when this occurred. If the hotspot was actually a long-term care facility in St. Albans or Swanton or a correctional facility or what have you, then obviously that would happen at a facility-wide level as well. Generally does not happen um, at the level of the entire community um, in terms of the kinds of statistical look you're, you're trying to describe there uh, by any means. So if 44 cases in Swanton show up, you, the health department, does not feel it needs to reach out to that town of 6,000 and say, wow, you're number three in the state and you're right so, so, again, I think you're mistaking the fact that the majority of those cases were probably part of the prison, so all the appropriate steps were taken with regard to that population and that facility, as opposed to that the town uh, had a huge problem on its own. That's how I'm interpreting well, I, what, you're, what you're saying. Well, I'm just trying to understand that the town the town doesn't seem to get notified. The city of Burlington didn't seem to get notified. I don't know if they were ever notified about their problems. I'm just wondering, does the town have any right to expect any information from the state of Vermont when some they, there's a major number in their community? Right. That's all I'm asking. Is, no, absolutely. Is and so, and so, right. And so when, when the numbers are in facilities that are in these specific towns, the town is quite aware of what's going on and are looped in completely. All right, and we still have five callers and you're missing, it's almost one o'clock. I guess you're, so, if I can just follow up, missing the point. I'm talking about outside the facility when Swanton or whoever uh, has a large number and whether they're in the prison or not, I'm talking about a large number in a community. Where do your local health officers fit in in your network into being told right, about so, this so, so you're mistaking the role of the local town health officer. They have a very discreet, specific job description, and this is not generally part of it. They're not part of our contact tracing workforce. They're not part of our infectious disease epidemiology workforce. Uh, that workforce is appropriately deployed. Um, and uh, I would invite you to speak to the mayor of the town where the nursing facilities were affected, uh, who's been uh, looped in on a number of occasions when those issues occur. Mike, we have to move on to the other callers. No, no, that's fine. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Andrew, you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Yeah, hi there. Um, Mike raised the subject, so I won't really ask a question on it other than just to offer the comment that uh, the town by town map, I know. Uh, the Northeast Kingdom residents and readers we've heard from would love to see uh, that map produced with, with a little more detail, seeing as every town in the kingdom uh, is blank. 
Um, but with that said, I'll go on to my question, which um, was alluded to by uh, Secretary French earlier. Um, a number of our schools are trying to plan for graduations, and you mentioned the end of uh, school year guidance coming out. Can you just speak to what that uh, guidance will cover, and will it be definitive? Will, be, will, will school uh, boards be able to use that guidance and, and begin to make their plans next week? Uh, yes, I would hope. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, I would hope they'd find the, the information useful, but um, I'm, I can't speak to what's in the guidance yet because we're still in the process of developing it, but it should be out next week. It will be out next week. Okay. And so, I mean, some of our schools are, are, are making plans. Some are, you know, talking about a, a, like a drive-in movie theater type of graduation. Others are postponing. Um, so if, if basically they just wait till next week, you know, will that guidance be in place for the end of the school year? Can they assume that what is going to be released next week will be enough information for them to be able to develop their plans yes, and for families to anticipate going forward? Yeah, that's the intention of the guidance and the timing of it. Oh. All right. Thank you. Joel Burlington Free Press. Joel? I'm no longer muted. Go ahead, Joel. Yep. Uh, hi. Uh, I would like to say something witty and, and poignant about um, how journalists are masters of brevity, but the cat's got my tongue. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Levine, um, I have a question about the possibility and maybe the probability that um, the state will see an increase in new cases due to the gradual opening up of the economy and the increase in testing. And I was wondering for everyone's peace of mind, if, if there is such a thing anymore, if um, there has been any way to model or predict the extent to which we might see a rise in cases. Because I suspect that people are looking at the case tally like a scoreboard and um, might see it as a failure at any number of levels if, 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 if the case number rises. So, yeah, my question, um, in short, not that short, but is there any way to predict and even quantify what might be the increase? Thank you for those questions. That was relatively short. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to make my answers relatively short, too. Uh, First, uh, we, we are expecting that there will be some rise in cases um, just as a result of people being able to become more closely contacted with one another than perhaps they have been up to this point in work environments and what have you. But the real underlying part of your question has to do with how often is COVID present in an asymptomatic person? And the person is actually doing fine, may not realize they're infected at all, but they're uh, walking around in society and have the infection, but they've been blessed by not having a severe manifestation of it. And then how often are people in that 48-hour period before they do come down with true symptoms where they are pre-symptomatic and infectious to others? So. You know, based on some of the uh, surveys that Secretary Smith talked about earlier, where we were uh, at the Veterans Home and a few other s uh, selected facilities that were higher risk in Vermont, and how little we found, we wonder how much asymptomatic infection is out there. Uh, but by the same time, we're not, na by the same token, we're not naive. We know that asymptomatic infection does exist. And uh, it's just a matter of quantitating how much. I hope that in the ensuing several weeks, we can go back to talking about that other type of testing that we've purposely avoided today, the antibody testing, which will again give us a little bit of a view of how many people have had uh, contact with the virus but didn't even realize it uh, and understand that. So that's what we'll see. 
Um, the modeling part of your question, we have not uh, sort of said success, we helped preserve the healthcare system, we limited the number of people with COVID and with death, so we're done. The modeling exercises are actually ongoing and they will continue. Uh, they, they will have a little more uncertainty about them because of the fact that no one knows about when or if this uh, second peak may, may arise. But they will be, the modeling studies, to be most precise, and that's why ours have become very precise, are based on sufficient testing occurring in the population and a, a sufficient trend in the numbers of new cases on an ongoing basis. Um, to draw their information from. And that's why when we got to where we got to in the last week or two, we were getting more and more confident that we were not in the worst case scenario, but we were in fact in the best case scenario as to how we dealt with this first uh, episode of COVID in the community. So hopefully that same kind of modeling can be done in as an informed way because our data will be very uh, rigorous, there will be sufficient testing, and it will be consistent over a time period where it can inform the models well. So there's no, uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, it sounds like there's no easy way, anyway, to say, well, we anticipate a, an X percent uptick, or it's possible we'll see an X percent uptick. No, you're right. There's no easy way, but at least early on in these next weeks, uh, we'll get a much better sense of uh, how much asymptomatic uh, carriage of the virus is out there. And I think that will, in fact, inform us uh, significantly. So maybe not today, but over the next several weeks, we could have a better predictive ability to tell you that kind of percent. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. Liam, VPR. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm wondering about what the plan is for expanding testing within the general population as you're phasing in this expanded testing approach. I think the general population is going to be included in some capacity, but uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. So many of the, the groups that uh, we've talked about, some of them are indeed very specific and very vulnerable, but many of them really do reflect the general population. Whether we're talking about uh, healthcare workers in, in the healthcare workforce, um, whether we're talking about people who um, are uh, identified as a contact because they had contact with someone who was a case, um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of more general population than we have. And even in the testing we're doing now, over these last number of weeks, where the rate of positivity has become much lower, I think that we have found that there are a lot of Vermonters who are by definition more mildly symptomatic uh, and uh, still haven't had COVID but they do represent the general population in terms of mild symptoms, nothing that would put them in the ICU that night. Um, and then whether they turn positive or not, they're reflective of the general population. We, we're certainly not forbidding the general population to be tested with all of these targeted initiatives. They are still part of the uh, underlying strategy. Right. I guess I was just trying to get a better sense of as you're talking about expanding testing and more specifically to um, healthcare workers and, and you know, nursing homes and whatnot, um, just trying to get a sense of what the community spread of the virus looks like outside of those facilities and congregate settings where, uh, you know, disease transmission is more likely. So just trying to w wondering if this testing expansion is aimed also at giving you a better sense of what generally the virus spread looks like outside of those um, facilities and settings? Yes, and the, an the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm hoping to fit both of the remaining two callers in, so please keep it brief. Guy Page. Guy. 
All right, Scooter, the other paper. Guy or Scooter? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, this is Scooter McMillan with the other paper. Um, we've talked to someone who had seen a USPS, uh, United States Postal Service delivery person, taking packages into a senior living facility without a mask. And when they questioned the driver, they said they were not required to wear masks or other PPE. Um, and I talked with a USPS official who confirmed that, although they recommend that their drivers delivering packages should wear masks and gloves, they cannot require it. And he said that uh, changing the contract uh, would happen at the national level and take months, maybe even a year to renegotiate. However, he did say that when local or state ordinances mandate the wearing of masks and gloves, the drivers are required and do wear gloves or masks. So my question for the governor is, um, are you concerned about delivery people wearing masks, particularly into senior living facilities or other places where residents are immunocompromised and do you have any concerns about and uh, or any plans thoughts about an executive order requiring for UPS, USPS and other delivery drivers to wear masks yeah. thanks for the question uh, first of all uh, yes I am concerned about anyone coming into one of those long-term care facilities without a mask and uh, and uh, possibly harming anyone in the uh, the building so um, we'll um, we'll take a look at that it's the first I've heard of that uh, so uh, we'll we'll take that into consideration and maybe uh, we'll talk with the long-term care facilities and see if there's a another path forward uh, or whether we can uh, we should uh, and uh, we certainly can uh, provide for that if uh, if need be but thanks for bringing it up we we hadn't realized Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Marathon session today. We'll see you on Friday.